Welcome everyone to uh, the session, uh, creating value first product organizations by Kai Gill. Uh, we are all happy to that you guys have made it to the session. Um, without any further delay, uh, Kai, over to you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Kai Gill, and um, what I'm going to talk about is how to succeed in product development. How Now, there, there are a lot of techniques out there, but they don't actually help you to succeed. And, and um, there are some basics uh, that seems to me, according to me at least, uh, we're missing some really basic fundamental things to succeed in product development. So uh, you see I'm holding up these two violins. Now, they are uh, violins that I bought for my son. And one of the violins I bought for 400 euro, and the other is worth 10,000 euro. So now, if you look at them, uh, you know, on a function and feature kind of user story kind of level, um, they are actually kind of identical. Yet one is worth 400 euro and the other is worth 10,000 euro. So what's, what's going on here? And you know, the question to you, the way you describe your requirements for the project, for your products and projects and services, uh, would, would, would that really capture the difference in these two violins? And if not, what are you doing? I don't know. So, and, and just for fun, can anyone guess which violin is, um, is worth, uh, you know, 10,000 euro? Let's do that. Which violin is worth 10,000 euro? The one in my right hand or the one in my left hand? The darker one, the left one in your left hand. Yeah. Uh, the right hand. Yeah. Left. So it's really, you know, it, there's no obvious way to say which one of these just by looking at them because they, they really look the same. They are more or less the same. Now, the left violin is made in China. It is uh, 400 euro. And it's not actually a bad violin in that they have actually engineered it to be 400 euro. They have, they have put a lot of effort into bringing that price point down while still keeping the sound good enough for, um, for students, right? So my son, you know, started off as a student. I didn't want to buy this extremely expensive violin. And then, you know, there's no interest in, in, in being a violinist. So, so they had to make it not just cheap, but good enough. And it, it sounds quite good. Uh, then on the right side, it's handmade, uh, you know, in, in Poland, Polish uh, person, and, uh, you know, it, it sounds just amazing. So the thing is, if, if we're, you know, if you're doing some kind of user story, that's more like doing tasks, uh, not really creating the, the quality level or the values, I typically call them values, uh, the qualities, attributes, those, those good things that we really want so much, that those things you find maybe in Apple products, but you also find them in Android. It's just there's, there, there's a different angle, a different twist to it. So, so that's uh, one of the key things we're going to be talking about today. Let me move on from that, uh, probably. So what I want to do is I want to show you how you can become an expert in succeeding in your projects. 99%, you know, maybe 100%, very close to that. As an engineer, I don't w want to, to, to talk about 100% here, but uh, I, I'll show you that uh, this way of doing things gets extremely high success in projects. And if, if I'm even halfway right in this, you guys better, you know, scream with joy because that's not really what you guys are experiencing today. Um, okay, so there is a report uh, from the Standish Group. It's called the Chaos Report, where they survey thousands of projects all over the world. Uh, and the one from 2015, I have some data from. And even though agile projects are three times more likely to succeed, uh, you know, they're like 39% rather than 11% and some kind of an average uh, it's still mainly failing, right? So if 39% uh, likely to succeed, that's a whole lot of failure projects. Here's a little graph of that. So here's waterfall with small, tiny little projects, medium and large projects. And here is agile. So 
yeah, it's better than waterfall, but waterfall is shit. I mean, that's that's a disaster to do things uh, when you're actually developing new things. You're not copying, right? You're you're creating uh, new things with new technology. With there's so much new, so much unknown. There's no way waterfall is going to do the job, right? So let's let's just get that out of the way. Then agile is also failing. These are the failure, right? So what we're trying to do <coughs> is, is mostly su succeed. And there are some key things there, already hinted at with the violin, that is, that is just leading this systematically to fail. So let's go and, and look at some of those key things. Now, uh, here's a, a Tesla Roadster. I'm, not, I'm sure you don't have too many of those on the street. Actually, this one doesn't exist except in prototypes yet. But uh, look at a couple of things. Uh, they are not, what are they not talking about? Because there's something about these uh, electric cars. Uh, you know, sorry, I, I sort of gave it there away. They're electric, but they are not bragging. These are the front pages of these page of, of the you know their current sort of offerings. They they are not saying, oh, buy an electric car. Why? Because nobody wants the technology. They want the outcomes of the good technology, right? The the outcome of, of these Tesla cars, the way they're put together, is that they're good for the environment, they're fast, they're silent, they have you know great range, etc. So these are the outcomes so if if you so tesla got get this and i don't know tesla is maybe not so hot in india but it is hot in in norway i i have one of these cars the the s and it's a fantastic product uh and yeah it's electric but that's secondary you will find it you know you scroll down the page it will talk about the electric motor this that and the other but it's focusing on how great the car is. For a long time, the front page of Tesla was the safest car in America, right? It was the safest car. So this is something we need to uh, to catch on to. Now, in Norway, we are not famous for cars. We, we, we made one many, many years ago called Troll, and it didn't go very well. And then we made an electric car as well. Oh, look at this one. I can't, this, this one would be good to have in India, right? Okay, we made this one in Norway. Now, look at the advertising, 100% electric. It looks like they're quantifying something as well, but they aren't, right? Electric is either electric or not. I mean, you have this hybrid thing, but um, so maybe there's some something to it. But the whole point is nobody wants an electric car. And Norwegians, we advertise, I'm from Norway, we advertise, uh, you know, this new product, it's 100 go on, run out and buy this car, it's 100% electric. Uh, and uh, Tandel is saying, however, being electric is one of the outcomes, isn't it? No, it's a technical solution. So the, now you need to bring this back to you, right? Most of you are, are well, some of you are in car business, I think. I, I, I was having the workshop and we had Volvo and was it Ford? Sorry if I got that wrong. Um, so maybe some of you are from, from Volvo or Ford or some other car manufacturer. No, electric is not an outcome. It's a technical solution that can be changed out with a gasoline, with propane, with nuclear, with, with whatever you like. Um, it's just one technical solution. And the, 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 the users, the buyers don't really care. They, they, they do say, like in Norway, people say, I want an electric car. Some people do say that, but what they mean is, I want the outcomes of an electric car, which is good for the environment. It's quiet. It's fast. There's a lot of really good stuff with it. So, so think, by the way, you know, being advertised 100% electric, that was their main slogan. Um, they went bankrupt and then somebody bought them up and then they went bankrupt again. And, you know, they, they finally vanished. I think they were acquired three times, uh, kept the slogan though. So I think that uh, to, to succeed, these outcome values, uh, like like you saw at Tesla, they need to be quantified. Notice on Tesla, it was all quantified. You know, the speed, the range, uh, all kinds of things. You, if you look at their website, they're clearly very quantified, very systems engineering minded. 
So I think the number one skill you need to have to succeed in product uh, development is to capture the stakeholders, uh, what the stakeholder sees as success, their success values. That's your starting point. So that means uh, you can't use user stories to capture it because that's only focusing on the user. That's way too limited. What you need is stakeholder focus. And users, of course, you need that as well. But that's just one stakeholder out of you know, your, your 30, 40, 50 stakeholders that you need to capture and understand what they see as success. So you need to capture what the stakeholder sees as success, their success values. Uh, and then you need to understand where they are today and with quanti quantification, where they want to be in the future. So you quantify you know, their success, where they are, where they want to be. There is a gap. If you can close that gap, that is going to lead you in the direction of success. Then every decision, everything you do, um, every uh, prioritization, every task, every action of everyone in the team can work towards getting to that result. Uh, okay, a little bit about me. Uh, I am. Uh, I have been an apprentice of my father, Tom Gilb. Tom Gilb has actually done lots of stuff in India. I have too. Been uh, not lots, but I've been working in India a little bit, and uh, and uh, I've been uh, teaching these techniques mainly to you know large progressive corporations that want to be the best in the world. And I've not you know been so much out there for people uh, to to learn it uh, because it's. You know, we've mainly been working for these guys. Like uh, one of the big, our biggest clients here is Intel. Intel have trained 20,000 engineers in this technique. So we, I've, you know, me and my father, we've trained the train trainers uh, and then they've trained on. And it's been a voluntary process within Intel, not mandated by anyone, but it's just been the, the way to do things. You know, everyone knows if you want to, at Intel, if you want to be an engineer that, uh, has a good grasp of your sort of uh, projects and, and skills, you need to go and learn this value first. They call it competitive engineering there, but it's the same thing. Uh, okay, um, I, I just skipped some slides here. This is, uh, this is me with a little longer hair. I actually look more like that today with a little bit of Corona here. Uh, then, and my father, and then this is Virginia. Meet Virginia, she's a CEO of a startup. And this startup, they produced a waterless toilet for third world countries, for villages that don't have, you know, running water and uh, sewage. Uh, so they would do their business in the bush or in the, you know, in the river or wherever they would do it. And uh, that would be um, hygiene, you know, health risk. So she was creating this waterless toilet uh, that also produced energy. So, uh, you know, create energy for... Uh, uh, both, uh, you know, charging mobile phones uh, in the village and uh, and uh, getting hot water for for showering, etc. <clears throat> now, when we met them, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they had issued a one million dollar prize to the startup that could, you know, come up with the best idea. So when that happened, of course, uh, hundreds of projects all over the world were trying to you know, pitch their product as the product that should win the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a million dollars because you know, that'll do a lot of good for people like Virginia. So, uh, and, and they already had sort of a prototype. Now, what we taught them was a couple of things. So it started off with stakeholders. So this is kind of fancy, they're stakeholders. I'm gonna focus in on one. So here you see the stakeholders, NGO, community, Melinda and, and uh, Bill Gates, Lou Watts, sponsors, media, etc. So the point here is there's not users. <laughs> you, you, you know, users, yes, but Gates and, and Bill and Melinda Gates ain't going to install this toilet in one of their mansions, right? It's, they're not the user here. So... Uh, to succeed in products, what you need to do is you need to have a, a working list like this of all your active stakeholders, and uh, and then you need to attach it. Sorry, I need to cough. <coughs> then you need to attach it to the values 
that they are interested in, the, you know, their improvements, what they see as success. And then you need to quantify that with how well are they doing, how much better can they get because of us, because of our products and services. That's sort of the key to succeed, Su succeeding in satisfying your stakeholders. So if you want to do that, you need to understand what they want, and that's how you can do it. So um, let's focus in on one of these values. So here's a little um, sort of template that I use when I quantify values. Uh, this is a simple simplification of it, but uh, we have a value here, sanitation, and the, we, then we quantify it. So whenever there's a value, I always have like this template. Okay, next, quantify. I never talk about highly uh, user-friendly system, something like this, because user-friendly is a value. It has variation, so I need to quantify how user-friendly. Okay, but this now we're talking about sanitation. So the proportion of waste that is collected in like a village in an area. Uh, and, uh, and you know, they go into a village, nothing is collected, it's all going into the bush. And then they set the goal of uh, collecting 75% of that area. And then there's something here for prioritization say, hey, we at least, if we don't get, you know, we aim for 75. If we don't even get 25, we're kind of a waste. We're, we're, we're losing, we're failing. So this is a failure point. So mainly I'll be talking about succeeding. That's defining success. But here is defining failure. In between is not quite success, but not failure either. <laughs> so once you have it quantified, it's not either success or no success. There are degrees of success or degrees of failure. So this is a... So if you look at all of... Um, let me go back. If you look at all of these little ones, these are all quantified values for the toilet where, you know, this was, uh, this is just one of them. So they quantified the values, attached it to the stakeholders, you know, ask the stakeholders, what is it that you want? What, what outcome, like 75% of the waste in the village is, co is collected? That would be an outcome, not electric. <laughs> Whether the toilet is electric or hand pump driven, like um, that was one of the comments. That's not the outcome. The outcome is the waste is collected. You see the difference, right? The car, electric or gas, that's not an outcome. That's a, a how, a solution. And you need to be super clear about the difference between outcomes and solutions. And we are not. As a culture, we just don't, we're not there yet. Okay. So, um, uh so make sure, this is just like a reminder, make sure that uh, you have a list of stakeholders, not just your users, not just user stories, 20 to 50 stakeholders per project is as a rule. Every project is different, but if you have three stakeholders, you're missing something. You know, you need to get up in the numbers of 20, 50, otherwise uh, you're, you're missing, you're not understanding it. And then you need to define the outcomes and you do that uh, quantitatively. So here's uh, the Luwat person. Uh, the, the, what happened was here's a Melinda Gates Foundation, and guess who won the, the million dollars? Um, it was uh, Luwat, and this is among so many people wanting to to get that money, and they did this because they were able to present the the values, the outcomes of the various stakeholders. Um, you know where they were, where they want to be, from the village to the uh, Gates Foundation to all the various stakeholders. So it's pretty cool to get the million dollars for a little startup like that. Uh, and I hope you're seeing uh, this. Okay, so uh, what you need to do to succeed is define success well and then lead all decisions, all F actions, all efforts towards creating the defined success. Look at this. Uh, this uh, caterpillar here, uh, lots of ants, they're pulling the caterpillar, this huge caterpillar related to them in the same direction. There's no, no ant is sort of pulling or pushing this caterpillar in a different direction. That's what you need to succeed in a project. Com they're, they're so complex. There's so many options in your project. So if you have unclear outcomes, so that, that means the guy, you know, the guy in your project that you think is always a, an idiot and, 
and doing the wrong thing, he is actually probably pretty smart, just pulling it in a different direction because he has a different understanding of what we're trying to achieve. So, so what I highly recommend is you get super clear, sort of top ten values of in the in the you know this type of quantified outcomes that we want to achieve with this project, and then you have everyone pulling the project in the same direction. So I'm going to show you three super power skills uh, that that you should use to, to um, succeed. And one is what we said, capture the value outcomes. Uh, number two, uh, you need to be able to prioritize. Now, these two skills in Agile, if you look at the Agile community, there's very little useful information out there. There's tools about this and tools about that. There's stand-up meetings and this, you know, this, that, and the other. But actually, how do you capture the outcomes quantitatively is kind of not there, except if you go to, to guild.com, you know, our, my, my work, my father and my work. Uh, but, it, you know, in the, big, in the big picture is not there. And then number two, prioritizing. Now, if you think Moscow or some other high, medium, low kind of prioritization technique is prioritizing, it is not. That's labeling what you have prioritized. You already done the prioritization, but how did you do that? And then you label something as high. And it's really bad to label it because it changes in time. You actually need a dynamic prioritization system that changes in time. Sort of like if you're hungry, then you eat. And then when you've eaten, you're not hungry anymore. <laughs> then you need other things. So that's dynamic prioritization. So you can't just say, you know, eating is priority number one. Because then you just eat and eat and eat. You, you know, that need, it needs to be dynamic. And I don't see that uh, available. And then when it comes to... Delivering value. Actually, uh, my father, Tom, my, my mentor, he has been uh, sort of the, the grandfather of Agile. The guys who made the Agile manifesto, they got the, their inspiration from him. And he was back then talking about delivering value in short cycles. And they're like, yeah, we need to do things in short cycles. No, it's not doing in short cycles. It's delivering value in short cycles. Completely different mindset. So... You need uh, to, to have, for you know, so in like the Scrum Guide, it says uh, for every sprint, you should, uh, you know, produce a, a potentially shippable code, something like this. This is wrong. This is mad. This is crazy. It is not code. Nobody wants your code. Like nobody wants an electric car. They don't want electric car. They want the outcomes of it. So if your code has no good outcomes, it's not the interesting thing. It's the outcomes you have to deliver. So, you know, everyone, when you go back and do sprints, uh, the sprint is about delivering outcome to stakeholders. <laughs> okay. Superpower skill number one is to capture the outcomes your customers desired. Meet Jens. Uh, he was tasked to, um, to uh, buy Microsoft. His company was asked to install a CRM at a big telephone company. And he got the job from his company, which was called Avenid, to do the job. Now, what most people would do is probably roll it out, you know, look at the CRM, look at how do you install it and roll it out in, in some way or fashion. He didn't do that. He went knocking on doors to, to the people that are his stakeholders. And among them were the chief technical officer, you know, proper C-level executive in a big telephone com uh, company, and he's kind of a T-shirt and jeans kind of, uh, you know, project manager. And and he said, hey, um, you know, forget CRM. Forget what I'm here and hired by another company to do. Like Microsoft hired me to install the CRM. Forget that. What is it that you want to achieve? That's a question you need to uh, to ask. What do you want to achieve? And and uh, it turned out they were losing 9.3 million euro every year from contracts that they had that were expiring without anybody doing anything about it. And he took a look at that and said, well, if I, if I don't roll out the CRM, if I just focus on solving this issue, uh, I can do that in two weeks because the contracts have a date, this expiring contracts. Now, I can use the CRM and I can install that in some kind of local little fashion and and uh, suck out the contracts that will, you know, expire in, let's say, two, two months and, and feed that to the salespeople and the salespeople can follow up and, and renew the contracts. And he did that and it worked. 
It worked in the sense that it didn't just work in sending the information to the salespeople, but it worked in the sense of not losing 9.3 million euros a year. So this was a huge win. Uh, Jens was from that point on treated as a hero sort of in, in the telephone company. So when he came there to, uh, to continue installing the CRM kind of, uh, he kept asking, well, what's, who are the stakeholders? What values are they looking for? And how can we solve those issues? And, um, uh, you know, uh, for the CRM people in the world, they have this big competition uh, who has the best CRM in the world. And this installation by Jens won the best CRM in the world that year. And uh, Microsoft was so happy about that that they shipped him first-class tickets to the U.S. for training and with a you know five-star hotel and 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 training and everything. Jens was just laughing. He's like, "Oh, they, you know, they, I was there in the first-class seats and drinking wine." And it's kind of it's kind of um, uh, cool, you know. Like, so when I talk about succeeding in projects, and we look at those agile projects and so and so, that's a huge percentage of the agile projects fail, and some of them succeed. When they talk about succeed, they're not talking about winning the Bill and Melinda Gates million dollars or, or you know, winning the best CRM in the world and getting special treatment from, from um, uh, Microsoft. But that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about 100% success, most of the projects that do this, they, they don't all win an award, but they get super happy customers because they focus on delivering value to the customers, not functions and features and user stories. You need to get rid of your user stories 100%. Just get rid of them. Um, now, uh, I, I was teaching this to some people, and this guy, uh, Niklas, came up to me and said, I understand, but it's so difficult for me to, uh, to measure. And in his case, it was usability. And I said, well, uh, Niklas, is it difficult to, to measure or is it difficult to quantify? And he, he hadn't even thought about the difference. So that's kind of how immature we are, and but how simple it is also. You, you need to get a handle on this. You know, if you think it's difficult to measure, that's kind of the wrong equation. You need to quantify first and then measure. So, for instance, uh, you know, if you go swimming in Norway, this is how we do it. We dig a little hole in the ice and we pop in there. Uh, and it's cold, right? So how do you quantify, how do you quantify temperature uh, in, in the chat? Anybody? How do you quantify temperature? Just, you know, a little, make it really simple to see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you see, Celsius or Fahrenheit, yes. Dipping your hand, no. Dipping your hand is, um, is a way to measure. So you quantify with Celsius and Fahrenheit and you, you measure with, thir thir uh, th I can't say that thermometer or you can dip your hand or you can you know there are many ways of measuring and there are cell, different ways of quantifying so in the same way that there are difference between celsius and thermometer you have to look at whatever quality or value that you are uh, needing to uh, quantify the outcomes of for your success you you need to understand there's a difference between quantifying usability and measuring usability um okay so that's uh, superpower number one. You need to be able to capture the outcomes of your customers, uh, and you need to do that with quantification. I'm going to skip that. Okay. Then number two, you need to uh, be able to maxim maximize the delivery of value outcomes to your stakeholders for your efforts. There's always going to be more things that people want than you have resources for. So you need to be really good at, at uh, prioritizing. And again, there's not, you know, in the agile community, they don't show you good ways to prioritize. So it's crazy. You have really, you know, you need good ways to, to capture the outcomes. That's number one. Number two, you need good ways to, um, to prioritize. Where, where are all the prioritization techniques? That's what it's all about because you always have unlimited resources and 
unlimited things that you're, you're, you're you, that you're trying to achieve, and those two don't go well together if you don't know how to prioritize. Uh, so there's a saying in Norway that uh, you know you can't compare apples and oranges. Actually, uh, in Norwegian we say apples and pears. Little pad it, and uh, in many countries it's apples and oranges. Do you have such a saying in India? If so, let me know in the chat. You know, you can't compare apples and oranges. Well, of course you can. Everyone compares apples and oranges all the time. You, yes, you, you call it apples and oranges or you call it something else. Well, of course you can. That's a dumb saying. It's an international saying and it's as dumb as it is widespread. Um, because when you go into the, the store or, you know, down to your market, uh, and you, you, there's apples, there's oranges, there's pears, there's other fruits there. What do you do if you're not comparing them? Of course you're comparing them. So how do you compare apples and oranges? Rather than saying you can't do it, let me ask you, how do you do it? When you go, st when you go to the store, how do you do it? Liter literally. In the chat. Freshness, yeah. Price, yes. Color, yes. Smell, yeah. Okay. So, uh, these are the values you have, right? You you want it fresh. You want the the, the development resource, the price. The, so, you know, as an example here, I say, okay, taste, nutrition, shelf life, resource, and then um, you you're trying to get the ones that have the highest value for the resources for the cost. So that's how you prioritize apples and oranges, and that's what you need to learn to do in your projects. You need to look at two different database systems, and you need to pick one. You can't use both Oracle and, uh, I don't know, MySQL. You, you have to pick one. So, so you, you can put them up, and then you need to have – you can't do this if these aren't quantified, right? You need taste, nutrition, shelf life to be quantified and clear where you are, where you want to go. Then you can take your various uh, – uh, solution ideas like apples, oranges, and these are symbolic for your solutions. And then you can say, well, this apple uh, solves 20% of my family's. Now, you might like other fruits better than me, but uh, this is uh, my family's sort of taste uh, requirements for fun. So this is 20%, this is 50%, and actually uh, pears are 90%. And then you can do an apples to orange quantified evaluation of what gives me the most value for my resources. <laughs> so you can look at uh, these give me the most value, but uh, actually pears cost more than apples. So here, because apples are maybe in season, so they are cheaper. So apples will give me more value for whatever, for every um, uh, unit of money I spent. So, let me show you another little case. This is confirm it. This meet Trun Johansson. Uh, when Tom and I uh, went to them, these are the number of people. It's a tiny little sort of startup company. Um, and here they're doing uh, this kind of table. It's, it's a little bit more fancy because it's not, you know, it's real. But it's uh, they're, here they're looking at usability. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, types of usability that they were looking for. And then they uh, quantified it, and then they were looking at uh, each cycle and which cycle would give them the most value for money. This very quickly, this is just doing the apples and pears, but in for each cycle, for each uh, sprint. Uh, so they had these uh, sprints. They were they they sort of shipped their their code over to uh, to the U.S. and then they were testing. So then they started the next sprint while the previous sprint was being tested. Now, here are some really impressive results. So confirm it, they do market research report, uh, uh, sorry, market research. And, and uh, you know, the time for the system to generate a service. This is quantifying the value, right? And then the past level was two hours. And then at this point of uh, when they wrote these slides, they're reporting it was down to 15 seconds. So a huge, this is not like 5% faster or something. Because when you quantify, you can, you know, really stretch yourself and stretch your team and say, hey, I want to be this 10x is very popular, right? So you can do like 10x, uh, but real quantification of not just saying we're going to be 10x, but quantify the 10x and, and do it. So 65 minutes to 20 minutes, 80 minutes to 5 minutes, 15. So 
uh, you know, 250 simultaneous users with a response rate of less than 500 milliseconds to five to 6,000 actually on the same hardware. It doesn't really matter. That's the solution. But they told me this was on the same hardware. Now, what happened with Confirmit was they had they had one big competitor called Pulse Train and was a much larger, more sort of, you know, successful, if you like, company than them. But because they did this, their their uh, customers uh, only you know all the customers only went to confirm it. No new customers went to Pulse Train. They captured they captured 100 percent of the market because these numbers you might think oh that was bad like two that two hours when you can do it. Well, the comp the competitors were still here. <laughs> They actually, they had, you know, everyone saying, hey, we need to do this to make it faster, et cetera. That's not, that didn't work. That's what they, that's what this led to. But by having clear quantified goals of, you know, reducing this to, uh, I think it was 10 seconds less than, you know, this was just on the way. Uh, they, they, they did drastic improvements in all the quality attributes of their product. And there's no way the competitors knew how to follow that at all. So, that's kind of cool. Uh, now, uh, uh, the developers loved it. For four years, they had, you know, doing this, they were so successful, so, such fun to do this. Uh, one thing that happens for developers that made them, so nobody quit for four years, nobody. Now, one of the things is because the developers were told not what to do, like create a button up here and it should be green. They were told what outcomes to expect. You figure out what to do. It was much more empowering and uh, interesting and, uh, you know, uh, triggered the juices of the, the creative juices of the developers. So they loved working there. They, they just acquired, they grew very fast. And actually, uh, you know, here's Pulse Train, their main competitor. Here's Confirm It. And here, a lower number is better. Seconds to generate a survey. And then suddenly Confirm It does this in 15 seconds. There's no comparison. All the customers got there, so uh, they ended up um, take you know uh, uh, acquiring their their big competitor, and they sent Tom and me over to what used to be Pulse Train and trained them. But they, uh, Pulse Train I couldn't compete anymore; they were just left in the dust. So they took them over. It's kind of cool. Hey, so yeah. um, yeah. Just to know, uh, just to tell you five more minutes. Yeah. I, I, uh, we can do Q and A, or I can go for five minutes. What do you guys want? Um, if you want to do Q and A, then probably next one one minute you should close this and then jump off to Q and A. Okay. We should wind up. And okay. Off yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll um, I'll do this and we'll do Q and A. So okay. uh, yeah. So last superpower. So that was superpower skill number two. Prioritization, right? So superpower number three is to deliver value to stakeholders for every sprint, right? Now, meet Paul V. He, uh, he uh, got hired for a job at what's called Bring. Uh, Bring Dialogue is a section of Bring. And they, they uh, have a, a, a product there which was cleaning customer databases. And uh, so that is you have a customer database and the emails get old, et cetera, and you send it to them and they replace the emails and phone numbers and addresses and then send it back to you. So your your database is uh, 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 truer to, to reality. So now he told me that the problem he was uh, tasked with was to, to um, that they had a old code and he was asked to reprogram it into C++, I think, from COBOL. Uh, now, he also told me that the three product owners before him was fired. They, they, they didn't manage. It's not, you know, it's a complex, an old complex uh, uh, program and it was hard to do. So, and he also had one month to come up with a plan and present it to the board and if he succeeded, uh, you know, if, if they liked it, he would keep his job. If not, he would be number four that was fired. So then we looked at the initial sort of requirement, say, okay, this is a database, uh, this system that cleans databases, uh, and it needs to be reprogrammed into C++. Uh, I, I asked him, well, you know, who are the stakeholders? 
and uh, and we had a list of them. But one of them was, of course, the users. And I say, okay, you know, what's the, what's really the problem? The real problem was it was too slow. It's slower than the competitor. And how slow was it? Well, it took two hours. I say, great. Now what we could do is we could focus on the two hours and bring this down to one hour, 30 minutes, I don't know, 10 seconds. Now, but I said, but before we go there, uh, let's, uh, let's look at, uh, you know, what happens before and after. Is there anything before and after the, this database is cleaned in our, in our computer system? So yeah, there's a whole lot, bunch of processes before and after, like the user has to send in their database and then maybe it sits in a queue and then it has to be prepared to go into the system. And then afterwards it has to be quality control before we send it back. And then they have to install it and say, well, how long time does that take? And about 40 hours. <laughs> so I say, okay, who's taking care of these uh, other processes? And you know who, right? Nobody, Mr. Nobody. They thought just fix the computer program. <laughs> so I say, well, uh, um, uh, Jens, no, not Jens, uh, Paul, uh, what um, you have to do this then. So, okay. So we set the goal of re uh, reducing the 40 hours to 10 hours instead of the two hours to 30 minutes. And, and then we, so we started off here. It was July and we drew a line down to sort of 10 hours. Now I said, uh, Paul, we're done. What do you mean? Well, you said you had one month to plan. Actually, planning is done. You can go home for the remaining 29 days of the month and come back and start working. I was like, I don't want to do that. Well, then you need to start working now. There's no point in planning and planning and planning when, you know, the, the part of doing things in short cycle is to learn and you do something and you get feedback and you learn. You know very little about this project right now. You know, it's a waste of time to plan. So he started doing. So before he went into the steering committee, uh, he had already shaved off four hours. So he used that month where she was put aside to do planning. He used, he actually started uh, reducing the time. Before he went into the meeting, he had shaved off four hours of the two available. <laughs> so the guys were like, what? And he explained how that worked. And then, of course, he got the job to continue. I mean, they were already beating those guys who were failure, uh, the three guys before him. And then actually, and then nothing happened because in summer we don't do anything in Norway. We take a month off. And then in September, 15 hours, 13 hours, 12 hours, eight and a half hours, he brought in another system, brought it from five hours to half an hour. Um, pretty damn cool. So this is what you need to do with each sprint. That's the, this superpower. It is for every sprint, you uh, don't produce code. You might have to, right? There's nothing wrong with it. A lot of times that's exactly what you do, but that's not the point. The point is, you improve the value for the stakeholders, some value, some quantified value that they really care about. Now, they really cared about it. Paul got promoted as responsible for all projects. Um, so, you know, he came in responsible for this one project out of, let's say, 40 projects within his division there. And they say, wow, you know, remember the other guys who did this, they actually, uh, the last guy, I don't know the two first guys, but the last guy he took over for, he had put in place a, a scrum team. So they, they were doing scrum and they were failing miserably. And then this guy comes in. He actually kept the scrum team because scrum is good in that it can do things in short, uh, short cycles and it's a good way to organize the team. So, you know, he kept it. It's like, great, great. I have, I, I'm not waterfall. I'm not big bang. I'm doing things in short cycle. I have a team that can work together. That's great. But you need to drive this with value improvements. So he, he put that in place and they drove it down to 8.5 hours. He got responsible for, you know, big promotion for him personally, right? To, to, and say, let's do this with all the projects. Okay, so I, uh, I'll end here. So that's super skill number three that you need.